before I start, uh, these have been re really interesting talks, and in particular, my life has been changed by changing land use with playas. We lived for 14 year, uh, 26 years just west of Quaker on 62nd, just north of the big playa there, Elmore Park. And between Utica and Slide, there were no houses. Eventually, they paved the streets, development came, and then the flow, I tracked the flow into that playa all the way up to Olive Garden. And you didn't have the sinking in of the, of the moisture. It ran off and backed up into our street to the point where um, we moved. And because uh, actually we were flooded, but uh, fortunately our house was a little higher than our neighbors who had, had, who had water up to the windowsills. But uh, that, that was a thing that actually affected me. And when I came here in 73, in that early period, that Elmore Park Playa would get so low in the winter, the Boy Scouts would go out and clean the trash off the island. After 83, with Hurricane Tico, the thing would routinely flood into the streets. So um, now where we live now is on 88th near Quaker. The park to the east of us has gotten so dry in the first time in the 14 years we lived here, Sunday morning I drove by it and someone had tried to drive his pickup across the park <laughs> and uh, it was being pulled out by the authorities. <laughs> and uh, so it looks dry. It's not completely dry though, as he found out. It, it's moist underneath. Um, this particular presentation was prompted by remarks that I made at one of the other uh, meetings here about some of the controversy that took place during the 70s when I first came here having to do with uh, weather modification. And uh, the term rainmaking I've used here actually uh, is sort of a cover term. Weather modification is sort of the, the, the fancy term. Under that you've got rainmaking and hail suppression. And it was actually hail suppression that was the issue in, se in the 70s when I came. The, um, the program here at Texas Tech was started by Don Harrigan, who I'm glad to see is here. And uh, when I came along later, I did not get involved in weather modification, but uh, Don, Jerry Jerica, Colleen Leary, they actually had research related to weather modification, not doing any themselves, but trying to understand the scientific basis of it and so forth. And so I was sort of an interest observer in some of this. Uh, I'm not. That's a disclaimer. I'm not an expert on uh, rainmaking or weather modification. The, um, the, the techniques used to try to produce rain, and not only in West Texas but elsewhere, uh, there are two general categories. There's concussion in the air and seeding. That's adding, adding materials to the clouds. The idea of concussion actually goes way back. Um, in, in fact, in a negative way, through the Middle Ages, the reports of towns in Europe ringing the church bells simultaneously to try to dissipate possibly dangerous storms. In particular, for example, in the Po Valley of Italy, very rich agricultural region, um, it's also subject to hailstorms like we have here in West Texas. And so there were attempts to try to break up the storms, the idea that the, the ringing would cause the storms to fall apart. Now, the thing is that the opposite view arose, particularly it seems after the Napoleonic War, Wars and the Civil War in this country, where there were anecdotes of heavy rain after big battles. And so the question was, uh, what's at, at uh, the formative mechanism here? Well, mostly it seems it wasn't necessarily the smoke and all that, but the actual, the concussion of all these, these firings of cannon and everything were somehow driving the water to form drops big enough to rain. And there was a book that was written in uh, years after, after the Civil War by this fellow Edward Powers uh, called War and Weather. And um, we're not talking here about the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, and incidentally, I noticed just today there's going to be a woman speaking about the Ho Chi Minh Trail on Thursday night uh, here at Tech. But uh, even, even during the Vietnam War, you know, there was attempts to produce rain uh, along the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. But that was not with concussion. 
But this, this book by Edward Powers had um, a great influence. I'll get back to that in a moment. The basis for seeding, that is adding particles to clouds, arose mostly in uh, the mid-40s. There was a guy named Vincent Schaefer who worked at GE, and uh, he found that he could add particles like dry ice to uh, a cloud and bigger drops would form. Now, clouds, cloud droplets are, do not fall, essentially. Cloud droplets are so small that while gravity acts on them, the resistance of the air or the drag force maintains them aloft. So in order to get rain, you have to grow particles of water to a million times greater in volume than a simple cloud drop. And another fact is that cloud droplets can remain unfrozen down to as low as minus 40, which is, happens to be the same on Celsius and Fahrenheit scales they generally will start to freeze at much higher temperatures, but still they become what's called supercooled in nature. And um, there was uh, another scientist, uh, Bernard Vonnegut, brother of the famous author Kurt Vonnegut. Bernard Vonnegut found that a particular particle that was effective in getting these uh, particles of these droplets to become ice was silver iodide. And so that led to a lot of the seeding that has subsequently took it, taken place. By going through a freezing process and having cloud droplets convert to ice and then attract humidity from the other unfrozen droplets, uh, you get large enough particles to, or droplets to fall as ice and eventually perhaps may, uh, uh, melt. That's called the cold rain process. If particles just collide, then and eventually some of them may get large enough to fall and uh, against uh, the resistance. That's called a warm rain process. Most of the cloud seeding that's done is uh, related to the, cloud, the cold rain process where you, you've got ice forming in the clouds and then that ice growing at the expense of other droplets. Um, rain enhancement is what we're talking about here. It's also possible in principle to create so many competing ice crystals in the cloud that none of them get extraordinarily big. And ideally, they would uh, be big enough to fall, but not big enough to remain as ice when they hit. So by pro providing enough competition between ice crystals in a cloud by proper, uh, so-called proper seeding, you, you would get the ideal situation where you suppress any hail, but you create rain. So basically, and you can't read all this, I know, in a warm cloud, particles grow by collision, they coalesce, get big enough perhaps to fall. That's not a very rapid process. In the uh, cloud that's tall enough to be cold, below freezing temperatures aloft, the possibility is that both nature and by artificial seeding, you, you would get some of the supercooled water droplets to become ice, and then they uh, draw water vapor from other uh, unfrozen droplets and grow big enough to become ice and fall and eventually melt. So that's the basic idea of rainmaking and uh, likewise hail suppression. In terms of how you get the materials into the cloud, there have been various things used. Um, Ground-based ground methods use in some cases a spray of particles in the cloud, and uh, another is possibly of using a cannon. Um, that's sort of, uh, th this has been used, for example, along the Red River Valley, trying to affect rain in uh, Oklahoma. And uh, this is related to uh, some of the work done in the early part of this century. It's also possible to launch the materials by kite balloon or rocket, and then somehow uh, remotely release that by explosion. The, the Russians long have promoted uh, using rockets to fire into what they call the accumulation zone in the storm and then uh, seed them that way. Uh, a lot of the work in this country has been directly by airplane, flying either over the cloud, 
or around the base, not through it. The material used, I mentioned uh, silver iodide has been widely used. Salt has been used in the warm rain process to try to have uh, water droplets grow and then dropping ice or dry ice to just cool the cloud to where ice forms has also been used. Now the earlier practitioners in Texas, there was a fellow named Dyronforth. Uh, he was called general, but he never achieved that rank. But he was in, in the Civil War out of Illinois. And uh, he's a very colorful character, but among other things, he was able to uh, talk people into uh, supporting him in the Congress. One of the Illinois congressmen actually got money for him, somewhat under $10,000, to carry out uh, rainmaking. And this was in an area down in Andrews County. And uh, there are different accounts of what actually happened, uh, but he was, um, he was using uh, balloons, launching them. He also uh, used kites and so forth. Uh, whether he was successful or not uh, was quite debatable during the time. Scientific American actually had an article, this was around 1891, saying that uh, it was all just a fraud. But uh, it was based on his ideas uh, gathered from that book by Powers, apparently, on the uh, explosions and so forth, being able to create um, rain. Now, another individual active in um, West Texas was C.W. Post, who you probably know from the serial. Post and Kellogg were both uh, serial uh, um, producers, and uh, Post, he had these uh, visionary ideas of uh, a utopian com community, and uh, he established it southeast of Lubbock. Originally, this was about 1902, 1905, <coughs> something like that, and um, the original location actually was up on the cap, and there's still a little, if you Google on the map, you still see there's a little community up on the cap, which was the original site, but apparently uh, Texas law requires that a county seat be within five miles of the center of the county, so they moved to the present location of Post. It was originally called Post City, and uh, they built little, nice little houses, and they encouraged people to, uh, to move there, and uh, beginning then, uh, in around 1910 or so, uh, he began experiments of trying to produce rain using kites and setting off explosions remotely using the kites. He also set off explosions along the cap. And uh, after about four years, they generally decided it wasn't doing any good. Now, he actually apparently didn't live there himself very, very much. And uh, eventually, after uh, an illness and a surgery, he committed suicide. I don't think that the failure of this cloud seeding has anything to do with that. Uh, there were numerous other people who were traveling through the areas from Kansas down to Texas, but uh, those were two of the ones that were um, important in our area. This is a cartoon done of, uh, back in the day about Post and uh, his attempts to uh, produce rain in our area. Totally $50,000 uh, in those days was what he apparently used of his own funds. Now the current practitioners, and I say current, I mean within the last several decades, um, there was the Hale and Lamb County controversy. Um, coming into play after the end of that was results from a National Center for Atmospheric uh, Research project called HYPLEX at ENRI, the National Hale Research uh, Program. And then uh, there are still many programs going on in Texas, some of them in, in uh, West Texas. The uh, cloud seeding in our area back in the early 70s took place in Hale and Lamb counties to the north of us. And uh, there were two groups, actually. 
and they had an airplane, and here's an example showing the flares with the silver iodide uh, that was burning and producing particles of various sizes, and they would fly around the base of candidate thunderstorms, and uh, they had radar to direct the, the uh, operations, and each year they would have to get approval from the Texas uh, Water Board uh, to carry out these uh, activities. Now, this was just about the time I came, and Don and I would attend the county seat hearings each year, and uh, to editorialize, I guess I'd say, it seemed that it was going to be a foregone conclusion that, that the state was going to allow these people to do it, um, being generally very uh, friendly to business. Uh, the farmers were mixed in their opinion. More or less, the areas east of I-27, you had uh, people who presumably had access to irrigation water, and if the hail suppression, which they were paying for, was successful, uh, and they didn't get as much rain, they did have irrigation water. Farmers to the west of I-27 in the dryland areas, they wanted anything they could get, toad slangers, hail, whatever. They didn't want to be robbed of any rainfall. And each year, there would be uh, just like a court hearing with lawyers and, and witnesses and so forth, testifying one way or another on whether they should allow this pro project to continue. And um, the um, scientists brought in, of course, would speak about how they could surgically add just the right amount of seeding material to produce uh, rain but no <laughs> hail. And uh, the, the, um, the pilots, on the other hand, uh, I talked to one of them, and he would say, well, we just look out the cloud and we go get, give it everything we got, you know. So uh, the, uh, the farmers became increasingly frustrated. And um, so eventually, uh, here are the two counties we're talking about, uh, Hale and Lamb County. Uh, the operations for the flights would head out in this whole area, both dry land and uh, irrigated areas, in order to uh, hit the clouds before they moved in, typically from the west or southwest. And uh, so eventually the farmers started shooting at the airplanes. <laughs> and uh, there had been a similar thing happen a few years earlier up in Colorado, the area west of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Uh, there was cloud seeding going on to suppress hail. Coors beer raised hops in that valley and uh, apparently hops is very sensitive to hail damage. And the controversy in Colorado led to um, violence as well. There were people on the one hand that thought that God didn't want you interfering with nature, and then the loggers in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains also thought that they were making too much rain, and so eventually someone blew up the radar and the state just canceled things up in Colorado. In, the, in our case, uh, there were threats of greater violence, and so the FBI came in, and uh, he maybe talked to Don, he didn't talk to me, but um, eventually the state held a vote. All the precincts over which the uh, project would have to take place were allowed to vote, and amazingly, it was voted down. And so that project, those projects in Lamb and Hale County ended. Now, there have been further projects. This is from, uh, the Journal of uh, Weather Modification Association, and this shows some projects in Texas. This is, doesn't have a date on it, but there have been controversies that I've, uh, just by Googling, things that uh, have happened within the last dozen years or so, up in the Panhandle, for example, with a project up there, and uh, some of the other places, um, they haven't hit the news so much, and we haven't been involved in uh, the research here at Texas Tech, so we've kind of lost touch in what's currently happening. But we do actually have uh, former students working with a project down here, and then this one in the Colorado River Municipal Water District is a long going project. One of our former undergraduates has been a meteorologist, meteorologist there for many years. So um, things will continue to, to be proposed, especially with uh, drought situations. And um, so if you hear anything about 
proposed cloud seeding for producing rain and or hail. Uh, hopefully this will give you a little bit of historical context to see where people are coming from. Thank okay? All right, it's new, so I know a couple of people might have to head, but do we have any questions? Yeah. Questions Don, you have a comment? Well, I'd just like to, to, mm -hmm. so you know, you talked, one of the biggest problems with weather modification, the only time people really think about operational weather modification is in periods of drought, yeah. when there's absolutely no opportunity to do anything. Uh, most of the research projects that have been done that have extended over long periods of time have shown that there probably is some possibility in the right conditions to enhance rainfall if the conditions are right, which of course the conditions aren't right during, during drought periods. What happened on the hail suppression project that Richard talked about here was the, the division between the dry land farmers and those who had irrigated, could, could irrigate their, their fields. Uh, the, everyone agreed that the hail suppression was successful. No one argued that. Uh, what they argued was that, uh, and Richard made the statement that one of the pilots said, we'll give it everything we have. The suspicion was, and, and probably uh, some, some is probably real, that they did give it everything they had, and that when they broke down the size by adding silver iodide uh, so that there's more competition for the water over more ice particles, that they could overdo that to the fact that not only <coughs> Would the particles be so small that they would melt before they reach the ground, but they would evaporate? And that the hail suppression project itself uh, was actually decreasing the precipitation. And that was the claim of the dryland farmers, and there was some indication that there was probably some merit uh, to, to that claim. Hal. Uh, this uh, concussion idea, did that just pass out? Or? Yeah, people generally dismissed it. There, there really wasn't any further scientific. Uh -huh. So there was not, people didn't think maybe where you had uh, uh, Air Force bases with a lot of right. jets taken off? No. Of right, no. Incidentally, I might mention one other thing. The, that first year I came here in 1974, April recorded visibilities at the airport less than seven miles due to blowing dust on about 150 hours. Since the records began in, of that kind of thing in 48, that's the greatest monthly record. Uh, the previous three years to that, we had hit, Lubbock had had about 60 inches of rain. Um, the previous three years to now, Lubbock has had about 30 inches of rain. The, the only other uh, period of where we've had something let, uh, three year total that low is the 1930s, early 1930s, uh, there was a three year period where we had 37 inches. So if we don't get a lot of blowing dust in this April, uh, it's gonna be amazing. Maybe the CRP has been more effective than, than uh, one would imagine, or maybe the, the weather patterns have, will have dif differed, but certainly we're at a stage where we could see a lot of blowing dust this next month. Thank you so much.